Howdy, welcome to Elementary Statistics. I am Lance Curtis. This is the lecture for Section 9.3, Two Dependent Samples Match Pairs. In this lecture, we're going to start off talking about good experimental design because in the last lecture, we talked about, we introduced the idea of testing uh, population mean for two different populations. And now, <clears throat> We're doing the same thing, but we're doing it with dependent samples, which are match pairs. So naturally, the question is going to come up, which is the better to use, independent samples or dependent samples? And so we're going to talk about that to start with. And then when, it, when, when we do find that we do need to use hypothesis testing or confidence intervals with match pairs, we're going to get into the actual methodology that's used. We'll start with the requirements that need to be satisfied because our methodology has certain assumptions built into it. We'll talk about how to form and test the hypotheses, how to use a confidence interval, and then we'll look at doing the same thing in StatCrunch. So let's get started. Here in this section, we're going to examine methods for testing hypotheses and constructing confidence intervals involving the mean of the differences of the values of two dependent populations. So whereas previously we were looking at independent samples, we we're looking at a comparison of the means between those, in, those independent samples. Now we're going to be looking at the mean of the differences. So before we looked at the difference of the means, now we're looking at the mean of the differences uh, because our samples are dependent. Of course, we have dependent samples when there's some relationship that exists between unique data points in each of our two groupings. The reason why the hypothesis tests and the confidence interval are supposed to come out the same is because we're using the same distribution and standard error for each. This is why when we test uh, for the mean difference and we set the null hypothesis equal to zero, uh, we can test the hypothesis by determining whether the confidence interval includes zero. This is why the two come out the same, because we're actually using the same distribution and standard error for each method. There really is no exact procedure for dealing with dependent samples, but we're going to use the student t distribution because it provides us with a reasonably good approximation. As I mentioned just a moment ago, we're going to start by looking at good experimental design. So the question is, which is better to have, independent samples or dependent samples? And the answer to that question is, generally, dependent samples with paired data are going to produce better results than two independent samples. Why is that? Well, because when you have this relationship between unique points in one data set uh, connected to unique data points in another data set, that restriction, excuse me, that relationship provides a restriction on the variability of the data values in each set. So there's much less variation that can occur extraneously when you have dependent data. However, on the other hand, if your samples are completely independent, then you don't have that restriction from the relationship that connects unique data points in each sample and therefore you've got lots more room for extraneous variation that can provide a confounding variable for your study. So typically dependent samples work better than independent samples. That doesn't mean that independent samples are always bad. Sometimes having independent samples can be advantageous especially if it's the only data that you can get for your study. Uh, so, I wouldn't be designing the study with the intention of saying, okay, so we want to look at this particular variable, but we need to find samples from another variable uh, so that we get dependent samples for our study. I wouldn't do it that way. I would go and study what you want to study, but if you have the choice to use dependent or independent samples, then in that case you want to select dependent samples. Our methodology is based on certain assumptions, so we need to make sure that certain requirements are met before we use our methodology. The first assumption we have is that the sample data are dependent. 
which makes sense since we're talking about dependent data that that that's a pretty uh, common sense assumption to make second samples are simple random samples this is a common assumption that's made third we either have enough data so we can apply central limit theorem or the populations from our sam that we're taking our samples from they're approximately normal so uh, we don't need to worry about central limit theorem there's got to be a, there's got to be a, uh, a normality underlying the distribution that we have so we can um, <clears throat> make this requirement now we have some special notation when working with match pairs first we need to understand that when we see that lowercase letter d what we're talking about are the individual difference between two values of a single match pair. So we take one data point from the first sample, we take the unique data point in the second sample that, that it's related to, that it's connected to with that re dependent relationship, and we subtract one from the other, and that gives us D, which is the individual difference. Now, mu sub d will be the mean value of all those differences for the population of matched pairs. If we're taking the mean value for just the individual differences of the sample, then that's going to be uh, d denoted by d bar. S sub d will then be the standard deviation for the differences d of the paired sample data. And n is the number of pairs of sample data. It's our sample size. Let's talk for a moment about testing a claim for hypothesis testing. So much of the same conventions that we've seen previously are going to apply here. We have a slightly different test statistic, however. Notice that the form of the test statistic is very similar to what we've seen before, but the variables are those that are uh, more related to using dependent data. So we have d bar minus mu d uh, divided by uh, s sub d over the uh, square root of n. Notice again, this mu sub d is the mean differences. Uh, it should be population values, which is not the difference between the means. Uh, sometimes uh, the sample values are used uh, for mu sub d, but when you're calculating the test statistic, this is really the population values and not the sample values. Note that we're looking at the mean of the differences and not the difference of the means. That's really important to note. And then once we have the test statistic, we can calculate p-values or critical values using t-table or software, uh, whatever floats our boat. We can also construct confidence intervals to evaluate dependent sample claims. So here's our general form, and notice that our margin of error is equal to our critical t value uh, multiplied by s of d over the square root of n. Let's look at an example problem to illustrate how this works. So here we have a table listing the heights in centimeters of five randomly selected U.S. presidents and their main electoral opponents. So we're asked to use this sample data with a significance level of 5% to test the claim that for the populations of heights of presidents and their main opponents, the differences have a mean greater than zero centimeters. In essence, we're, we're claiming that presidents tend to be taller than the, the, the presidents who get elected tend to be taller than their opponents. So first we need to make sure our requirements are met before we apply our methodology. First we have dependent data because our values are paired. Uh, they're paired together because we have a president who won the election and we have the main electoral opponent who lost that same election. Second, the pairs of data have been randomly selected so we have a simple random sample. And third, we only have five data points so we need to see if we can use central limit theorem to uh, give us a sense of normality. And let's just go ahead and check that with a, with a uh, normal quantile plot. So here we have a normal quantile plot for the data in our data set. And 
yeah, it looks like it's uh, not that bad. So we're going to check that off and say we've got that. So it looks like all three of our requirements have been met. So we can go ahead now and apply our methodology. First, what we want to do is form our hypotheses. And when we do that, the first thing we do is think about, okay, how do we represent the claim symbolically? Well, first, let's recognize what the claim is. The mean height of U.S. presidents, which we're going to call mu sub 1, is greater than the mean height of their electoral opponents, which we'll call mu sub 2. So therefore, mu sub 1 will be greater than mu sub 2. If I subtract mu sub 2 from both sides, I get mu 1 minus mu 2 is greater than 0. However, keep in mind that when we have dependent data, we're not looking at the difference of the means, but the mean of the differences. So we have to swap out mu sub 1 minus mu 2 with mu sub d, because we have d dependent samples. So now our claim is that mu sub d is greater than 0. Null hypothesis, as always, by definition, a statement of equality. So mu sub d equals 0. The alternative hypothesis is generally going to reflect the claim. We're going to see that in this case because our claim has no semblance of equality to it. So we're just going to adopt that for our alternative hypothesis. Mu sub d is greater than 0. Before we calculate our test statistic, we need to assemble some summary stats. So let's go back to the table that we had previously and add in another column, which we're going to call difference. And in this column, we're going to calculate values for d. So d is the difference between uh, individual data values that are, that are matched pairs. So I'm going to take the 189, subtract the 170, that gives me 19. 173 minus 185 gives me negative 12, so on and so forth down the line. Now, if I take the mean value of those differences, those values d, I'm going to get d bar, because this is the, this is the mean of the sample of differences. So the mean of these differences is d bar. So I'm going to take and just average it out, add them all together, divide by 5, and I get 3.2. And I'm also going to calculate a standard deviation for those differences. So I take each value, subtract out the mean, which is 3.2, and then take the, the take, square of that difference, and then take the sum of those squares, divide by 1 less than the sample size, and I get 11.4. Now that I've got d bar and s sub d, I can calculate my test statistic. Here's the general equation for our test statistic. So I'm going to substitute in what I know. Notice that we're setting mu sub d equal to 0. This is because we're working under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Remember, our null hypothesis says mu sub d equals 0. So assuming it's true, we're just going to substitute 0 in for mu sub d. The other values we calculated previously, and so we just substitute those in, punch this out on our calculator, and we get 0.627668. Now I have what I need to calculate a p-value. So I'm going to go into my t-calculator in Stack Crunch. And 4 degrees of freedom, because our sample size is 5. Put my test statistic in. This is the boundary for the area under the curve. And that area under the curve that's bounded by the test statistic is the p-value. So as long as this is matching my alternative hypothesis, and these other two numbers are correct, and they are, I press compute, and out comes my p-value, 0.2821. So now I can resolve my hypothesis test in one of two ways. I can take this p-value here and compare it with the significance level alpha. If I do, I find that my p-value is way larger than alpha. So the area for the p-value is way larger than the area for alpha, which is my rejection region. So I can't fit it in. Therefore, I'm outside the rejection region. Therefore, I fail to reject h naught. Alternatively, if I use the test statistic, I'll reach the same conclusion. Notice that uh, calculating a critical value, if I put alpha in for my area, then 
that area is going to be bounded by my critical value. Critical value of 2.13, it's a tail on the right side, so 0.663 is going to be less than 2.13, so it'll be to the left of this boundary for the right tail. Therefore, we're outside the rejection region. Therefore, we fail to reject H0. So either way you slice it, there's insufficient evidence to support the claim that U.S. presidents are taller than their electoral opponents. Now, constructing a confidence interval should yield the same conclusion. How do we do that? Well, first, we need to find our margin of error, E. To do that, we use this equation here. So, plug in the variables for the equation, punch this out on our calculator, and we get 14.15. Next, we substitute into the general form. Here's our general form. D bar, of course, is 3.2, as we saw earlier. Subtract 14.15 on the left, add 14.15 on the right, and we have a confidence interval, negative 10.95 to 17.35. Notice that zero is inside our confidence interval. Therefore, it is possible that the null hypothesis is true. Mu sub d could be zero, and since that is a null hypothesis. If that's true, we don't want to reject it. Therefore, we're going to fail to reject H0, which is the same conclusion we made before. And realistically, what this means is there's no difference between the mean heights of U.S. presidents and their electoral opponents. When we're doing the same thing in StackCrunch, Notice that we're going to use one menu option primarily, and that's going to be stat t stats paired. Typically, when you're going through these menu options in StackCrunch, there's a final menu option for with summary or with data. With paired data in StackCrunch, the way that it was designed was with the assumption that you're going to have actual data if you're running a test on paired data. So no summary stats here. And part of the reason for that assumption is, as you saw earlier, we need to calculate D bar and S sub D. So if that's not going to be given to you in a problem statement, then you're going to have to actually have the actual data to calculate it. Um, and, you know, somewhere along the line, you have to have the actual data. I mean, yeah, it could be given to you, but then someone's got to calculate it. So why not just build it in so that you have to have the data to begin with. That was like, I'm guessing that was the kind of the, the line of thinking that they had. So there's no with summary option. You have to have actual data. So select the columns up at the top where your data is located. Make sure you adjust the sign here for your alternative hypothesis to match. Press compute and out pops a lovely results window. Oh, and don't forget that this claimed value of zero, you're pretty much going to leave that alone because typically, you know, you're looking for um, the, the difference between the means, the means of the differences. I mean, either way, either way you look at that, I mean, you're going to want that to be zero. So just leave that alone for most of your problems. Then when you get the results window, as always, you'll read the test statistic and the p-value right off the results window. Confidence intervals, you're going to use the same menu option in StatCrunch, Stat, T Stats, Paired. When you get to your options window, make sure that this radio button for confidence interval is selected. The default is for hypothesis tests to be selected, so you want to switch that over to confidence interval. And you also want to make sure that you put in the right confidence level. Remember, we're looking at two samples, two populations. Our confidence level is going to be 1 minus 2 alpha. There are, of course, a couple of exceptions to that rule. The first one being, if your claim doesn't match your alternative hypothesis, so if, for example, you have a two-tailed test, then you're going to want to revert back to the way we've always calculated it, 1 minus alpha. The other exception to the rule is if you were specifically instructed in a problem to construct a confidence interval at a given confidence level. So you'll be told, construct the 98% confidence interval and 
even though 99% may be, may be the appropriate level, because you're asked to do 98%, that's what you need to do, 98%. Once you press Compute, you get the lovely results window from which you can read your lower and upper limits right there at the end. Let's look at an example problem to illustrate how this works. We have an investigation conducted to evaluate changes in body temperature with time. So the table at the bottom of the screen is listing uh, temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit for four randomly selected subjects measured at two different times of day. So the first time is eight, eight in the morning and the second time is at noon. We're asked the same seven questions that we've seen in previous lectures and we're asked to do this with respect to the claim that the body temperature at noon is on average higher than the body temperature in the morning. So we're assuming the body temperature increases as the morning progresses. Let's look at each of these questions individually, one at a time. So the first question is, what are our hypotheses? Well, as always, we need to first think about what is the claim that's being made. The claim that's being made is that the body temperature is higher on average at noon than at 8 a.m. Because the 8 a.m. was mentioned first, it's going to be the first group, the first sample. So that's mu sub 1. The temperature uh, at noon is going to be mu sub 2. So if it's higher at noon than, in, than at 8 a.m., then the first group is going to be less than the second group, which means mu 1 is less than mu 2. If we subtract mu2 from both sides, we get mu1 minus mu2 is less than zero. However, we're looking at dependent samples, so we want to test the mean of the differences and not the difference of the means. So we're going to swap out mu1 minus mu2 with mu sub d. So our claim is represented symbolically as mu sub d is less than zero. The null hypothesis, as always, a statement of equality, so mu sub d will be equal to zero. Alternative hypothesis, in this case, will directly reflect the claim, so mu d is less than zero. So yes, we have a match between our claim and our alternative hypothesis, and the less than sign in the alternative hypothesis tells us we have a one-tailed test on the left, which is a left-tailed test. Next question, what is the test statistic? Well, in StatCrunch, we're going to go to Stat, T-Stats, Paired. In our options window, we're going to tell StatCrunch where to find our data. And then we're going to make sure that the inequality sign in our alternative hypothesis matches with the drop-down menu listed here. Then we're going to press Compute, and out pops our results window. And we read the test statistic right off the window it's always the second to last value. The p-value is always the last value listed in the table. So there's the values we need to evaluate our hypothesis test. Now we can decide whether to reject the null hypothesis. Let's use the p-value to do this. So if the area for our p-value is greater than the area for our rejection region, which is alpha, then we're outside the rejection region and we should fail to reject H0. However, if we can fit the area for our p-value into the rejection region, which is the area of which is alpha, then we're inside the critical region and we reject H0. So here we have StatCrunch, here's our calculator, showing us our critical region. left tail test, so the critical region is on the left. The area is alpha, which is 5%. And then degrees of freedom is one less than the sample size, so that's four. Make sure that this inequality matches our alternative hypothesis. Press compute, and here comes the critical value, negative 2.13. Now we can actually look, you look and use our p-value to figure out, okay, so where are we at? Uh, with respect to our alpha, we compare the two and we find that we're just barely outside the uh, border for our rejection region, so therefore we fail to reject H0. 
what you conclude from this hypothesis test. Here's the four standard options that we're asked to choose between. So the first question we ask is, do we reject H0 or fail to reject H0? In this case, we fail to reject H0. Therefore, there is not sufficient evidence. So we're looking at answer options A or B. Now the next step is, do we want to warrant rejection or support the claim? And to answer that question, we ask ourselves, do we have a match between our alternative hypothesis and our claim? In this case, we did. Therefore, we want to select support the claim. Answer option B is the correct answer. So remember, there's these two key questions that you ask. It's the same process that's worked that we, we had in Chapter 8, and it's going to work for us here in Chapter 9. What is the appropriate confidence interval? Well, the appropriate confidence interval is going to have a confidence level of 1 minus 2 alpha. Okay, remember that since we have a match between our alternative hypothesis and our claim, that we're going to say 1 minus 2 alpha, and that's because we have two samples, two populations, one alpha for each. So the confidence level is not 95%, but rather 90%. Hit Compute, and out comes our results window, and we read our lower and upper limits right off the results window, negative 0.703 to 0.003. What do we conclude from these results? Remember, the question we want to ask is, is zero inside the confidence interval? In this case, it is inside the confidence interval. Therefore, mu sub d could be equal to zero. And if it's equal to zero, that's our, that is our null hypothesis. So if mu sub d equals zero, that means our null hypothesis is true, and therefore we don't want to reject it because it's true. So we're going to fail to reject mu sub d, and conclude that there's no difference. And that's exactly what we conclude. There is no difference on the average uh, body temperature between 8 a.m. and noon, because the mean of the differences could be zero, since zero is inside our confidence interval. In other words, body temperature seems to stay fairly constant in the morning. It's not going to increase like, the, like, like, like was claimed. Let's look at another example involving weather forecasts. So the table below lists the forecasted and actual high temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit in a given city for eight randomly selected days in the same month. And the forecast comes from five days prior to the, to the actual. So the prediction is five days in advance of the actual. And so what we're asked to do is answer the same seven questions that we saw previously with respect to the claim that the high temperature forecasted five days in advance is on average higher than the actual high temperature. So we're claiming that we're actually uh, forecasting the temperature to be, our prediction is higher than what it actually turns out to be. And by the way, if you don't recognize the picture there in the upper right, you are lacking in your education. You need to go watch Groundhog Day, one of the absolute classics of American cinema, and in my opinion, one of Bill Murray's uh, better performances. It's an absolute classic. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, you're going to want to check that out. Groundhog Day. So, <clears throat> looking at each of these questions individually, the first one is, what are our hypotheses? As always, we think first, what's the claim? Well, the claim here is that the forecast is inaccurate that there's a difference between the average forecasted high and the, actu and the average actual high. So mu sub 1 is not equal to mu sub 2. If I subtract mu sub 2 from each side, that's going to lead me to, to say mu 1 minus mu 2 is not equal to 0. However, we have dependent samples, so we don't want to look at the difference between the means. We want to look at the mean of the differences. And so I'm going to say mu sub d is less than zero. Wow, where did that come from? Mu sub d is less than zero? How do we go from not equal to to less than zero? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, hang on a minute. Okay, I think that's just a typo. So that should really say not equal to zero. And so there's our claim, not equal to zero. So by definition, we have a statement of equality for the null hypothesis. So mu sub d equals zero. The alternative hypothesis typically directly reflects the claim. Uh, in that case, we're actually saying there is there is a difference. So yeah, the claim should be mu sub d is not equal to zero. So it directly reflects the claim. So wait a minute does not match our claim. It says we have a two-tailed test. Yeah, so, wow, that's weird. So, yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. The not equal sign in the alternative hypothesis means we have a two-tailed test. So that part's right. Um, I thought that the l less than sign was a, um, no, actually, you know what? That is right. It's the not equal to sign that's the uh, typo. So this should really say that mu sub 1 is less than mu sub 2. And so mu 1 minus mu 2 is less than 0. Because that's how we get the... Um, that's how we get the over prediction. Okay? That it's actually less than 0. Because the actual uh, ends up being... Uh, the actual, which is the first group, ends up being less than the prediction, which is higher. That's the second group. So, yeah, so that so the, the typo is actually up here at the top. This n not equal to sign here should actually say less than. I'll have to go fix that. What is the test statistic? Well, in StatCrunch, go to Stat, T Stats Paired, and then in your options window, tell, data, tell StatCrunch where to find your data. Make sure that You've got a match here with your alternative hypothesis in the drop-down menu for an equality sign. Press Compute. And <clears throat> you, al you always want to make sure that you get this in the right order. So make sure you put the right groupings there. Otherwise, uh, you might get the wrong numbers to come out. But you put the right stuff in, press Compute, and out comes this results window where the test statistic, as always, is the second to last number in the results window. The last number in the results window is the p-value and so now we have what we need to resolve our hypothesis test. We can decide now whether to reject the null hypothesis. First let's look at the p-value. So here we have the <coughs> critical region in StackCrunch. It's a two-tailed test so representing this in StackCrunch we use the between option. Remember the between option in StackCrunch calculators is going to calculate the area in between the tails, but the tails are what we have for the rejection region. So in order for this to calculate out critical values properly, we have to put in the area in between the tails, which is the complement of alpha. Alpha here is 1%, so we're going to put 99% in for my area, and that gives me my critical values plus or minus 3.4995. So now I can take my p-value here and compare it with my alpha level and I'm way over my level of significance therefore I'm going to fail to reject H0. Notice if we use the test statistic we get the same result out. So test statistic of 0.258 puts me right about here inside the area in between the tails. And so the area in between the tails is outside the rejection region. Remember, the rejection region is always in the tails. So I'm outside that rejection region. Therefore, I fail to reject H0. What do you conclude from the hypothesis test? Remember, when you're looking at these four standard options, the first question you ask is, do we reject H0 or did we fail to reject H0? In this case, we fail to reject H0. Therefore, we want to say there is not sufficient evidence. That's answer options A and B. Now, we need to decide between warrant rejection of the claim or support the claim. And we have to ask ourselves, do we have a match between our alternative hypothesis and our claim? And here the answer is no, we didn't have a match 
And so therefore, we want to select warrant rejection of the claim, and that's going to be answer option A. So remember, it's just knowing these two key questions that get you through to the right answer. What is the appropriate confidence interval? Well, again, go back to your options window in StatCrunch and switch over that radio button to confidence interval. And here we're actually going to put one minus alpha for our confidence level because we didn't have a match between our alternative hypothesis and our claim. So this is one of those exceptions to the rule where it's not 1 minus 2 alpha, it's 1 minus alpha. So 99% is our confidence level, and we press compute, and out comes our upper and lower limits, negative 7.2767 to 6.2767. What do you conclude from these results? Well, of course, what we're really asking here is, is zero inside the confidence level, inside the confidence interval? And the answer here is, Yes, zero is inside the confidence interval. Therefore, mu sub d could be zero, and therefore there's no real difference between the actual predicted temperatures. We could also say that because mu sub d could be zero, the null hypothesis, which is mu sub d equals zero, could be true. Therefore, we fail to reject H naught. But in the real world, what this translates to is that there's no real difference on average between predicted and actual high temperatures. The weathermen actually know what they're talking about. That brings us to the end of this lecture. If you have any questions, you know what to do. Otherwise, I will see you in class or the next video. Thanks for watching.